So at uh, this time, I'll ask Pastor John Ross if he would like to come forward, and uh, we'll give him the official welcome to, to uh, Whangarei. Welcome, John. You've come, uh, come a long way to be here. Um, and you might like to just, uh, for a moment, uh, tell us where you've come from, um, because there may be some people here that wonder just who you're connected with, and uh, so you could perhaps make that clear for a second, yeah, just a short we'll time. Be happy to do that. Is this on? I think it's on. You've got you can all hear me. Good. It's just a great joy for me to be with you here today, this evening. Um, I'm from, uh, currently, from California. I work with a media ministry called Amazing Facts. Has anyone heard of Amazing Facts here before? <laughs> Has anyone not heard of Amazing Facts? It's just a great joy to be with you this evening. And um, what I'll be sharing with you tonight uh, we'll also connect in a little bit with what Amazing Facts is doing in the area of helping, strengthening churches, helping them set up an ongoing evangelism cycle. And I'll be talking more about that tonight. A little personal information, I am originally from South Africa. So if you pick up an accent that's not true American, well, that's because it's South African. I kind of have, there's some South Africans there. I have a little bit of that accent. I've been in the States for, uh, for a number of years. I arrived there in 90. I believe it was 91. And um, my wife is from California. We have three small children. And uh, I like to joke with people back in the States. Uh, I'm from South Africa, and my wife is from the United States. And so I tell people that makes my children African American. And the people kind of get a kick out of that. But it's just a great joy to be with you here. And we trust that the Lord will richly bless our time together as we, as the pastor said, Learn ways in which we can be more effective in sharing our faith with others. Thank you very much. I didn't have to ask you any of the questions that uh, they would like answered. Okay. Uh, I was listening the other day, and I heard you answering questions on a 3ABN program. And, uh, but I thought I might be able to have to ask you a few questions tonight, but I don't. You've answered all those questions. <laughs> all we need to know about your personal life, you've told us. Oh, okay. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, we'll leave you to uh, care for the program. If there's anything you need as we progress along, um, just say so. We're a fairly casual sort of an audience here tonight, so I don't think that we're going to be looking for the, uh, you know, the absolute in protocol or anything. But anything okay. you want, just say so. All right. And well, thank uh, you. we'll leave you to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I want to thank all of you for your wonderful hospitality. It is just a real treat for me to be with you. Um, in a way, I kind of feel like I'm, in a sense, back home because, believe it or not, there are some similarities between uh, South Africans and um, New Zealanders. I guess I was thinking Aussies there for a minute, but that's the wrong group, right? <laughs> Don't mention that here. <laughs> All right. New Zealanders, um, are probably because both groups have somewhat of a British influence. And so that is just wonderful to be with you. I came in yesterday and it was windy and it was rainy and it was cold. And it was wonderful because I've come from temperature that is 100 degrees Fahrenheit. No, yes, Fahrenheit. So it's very hot out there and dry. Uh, California doesn't get rain in the summer. So everything's brown and the trees just look like they need water so bad. And we arrived and everything's lush and green. And then today, clouds broke and the sun came out and it was just a little bit of heaven. You folks live in probably one of the prettiest places on the planet. Just wonderful up here, the rolling hills and the green grass. and It's just really, really neat. So it's a great joy and privilege to be with you. What I'd like to do tonight is look at um, a biblical perspective of evangelism. That's kind of the focus for our seminar this weekend. Now, starting on Sunday evening, we're going to have a seminar, but that's more on the prophecies of the Bible. And that begins on Sunday evening, and I believe it's at the Civic Center. I forget the name of it, but it's just a little ways down the street, not far from here. And that's going to be beginning Sunday evening, so I want to encourage you to come to that. But the focus tonight and tomorrow morning, and a little bit tomorrow afternoon, is going to be on evangelism. How do we effectively share our faith with others? That's what we're going to be looking at. But we want to begin with a good foundation. So we're going to start with a biblical perspective of evangelism. Now, in the church that I pastored back in the Midwest, uh, in Missouri, we had a song that we always sang at the beginning of our service. And I think you've heard the song before. It goes something like, we have this hope that burns within our heart. Can you finish it? Hope in the coming of the Lord. We have this hope that burns within our hearts. We always sang that at the beginning of our service. You know, friends, it is exciting to be an Adventist today, right? 
because Adventists believe in the soon coming of Jesus Christ. We have a hope that burns within our hearts, hope in the coming of the Lord. That's the motivation that we have in sharing our faith. Why do we share? Because Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming soon. He's coming sooner now than when we first believed. The coming of Christ is getting closer day after day. And if ever there was a need of urgency in proclaiming the good news of the coming of Jesus and the salvation that we can have through Jesus, it's now. So we begin by looking at a biblical perspective of evangelism. Now the rumor is, and perhaps you've heard it, evangelism doesn't work anymore. I've heard people say that. Oh, pastor, evangelism just doesn't work. We spend all of this money and we invite, you know, put the ads around town and we invite these people to come and, and then nobody shows up or maybe two or three people come from the community and at the end we baptize one person and then six months down the line the person doesn't come to church anymore and oh, evangelism just a waste of time. Well, the good news is that evangelism does work. Matter of fact, evangelism is very important. In the book Acts of the Apostles, we read the church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of man. It was organized for what? For service, and its mission is to carry the gospel to the world. Evangelism is really the heartbeat of the church. Now, during the Second World War, there were an elite group of paratroopers, specially trained, who were dropped behind German strongholds uh, in enemy territory, and it was their work to advance from the back towards the front lines of the German forces to try and weaken the front line, making way for the Allied assault. The Allies could gain a foothold in Europe. Now these paratroopers knew that their only hope of rescue or success was the completion of their mission. They couldn't retreat anywhere. They were in the midst of enemy territory. They couldn't quit. They couldn't run back home. They had to advance and keep doing the work they were assigned to do until the Allied forces came breaking through. Now, in the same way, I think of the church and the individual members as God's paratroopers. We are placed in the midst of enemy territory. This world is not our home, right? We're just passing through. And our commander Jesus has given us some orders. We are to advance the kingdom of God step by step, one person at a time, faithfully doing the work that God has called us to do until King Jesus comes breaking through the clouds of heaven to take us home. In order to be effective in the work that God has called us to do, we must remember that God has called the church and organized the church to carry the gospel to the world. Evangelism is very important. Now, from the very beginnings of the Advent movement, the Adventist church, evangelism played an important part. In the very beginning. Now at first, those early Adventists believed that they were fulfilling the Great Commission by simply taking the Advent message, the gospel, to those who were living in the northeastern part of the United States. They concluded that because the United States was a melting pot of people, that by sharing the gospel with those living there in those New England states, that was enough. But finally they began to realize that when the Bible says to take the gospel to all the world, that God means to take the gospel to all the world. And so they began missionary societies and missionary activities. Missionaries were sent all over the world to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know what's exciting? You can travel just about anywhere in the world today, and you can find three things, they say. Uh, you can find Coca-Cola just about anywhere on the planet. You can find Catholics just about anywhere on the planet. And you can find Adventists just about anywhere on the planet. You can travel through Europe, you can go to Africa, you can go to Asia, you can travel all over the place, and you will find a group of Sabbath-keeping believers that love the Lord. We're part of a big family, a family of God. And it's exciting. It's a missionary-minded movement, a missionary church. Three questions that we want to look at this evening. The first one is, what is evangelism? The second one, who does evangelism? Well, leave that to the professionals, right? Leave that to the pastor. Leave that to the elders. Who does evangelism? And why do we do evangelism? Three questions that we want to consider. The first question then is, what is evangelism? What is evangelism? Well, in the Bible, we find verbs used, not nouns, to describe evangelism. In other words, evangelism is an activity. It's not just a sitting back, but it's doing something. It's proactive. Evangelism is not passive waiting, but it is active going. In Matthew chapter 28, we have the Great Commission. And Jesus said to his disciples that they were to go into all the world 
teaching, baptizing, making disciples. The Great Commission is to go, not just to wait for people to come, but to actually go. Go share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the world. Now, the word gospel that we find in Scripture means to preach the good news, or evangelism means to preach the good news. Preaching is the active sharing, public sharing of our faith. Now, of course, preaching can be done in this sense, as we are tonight, a group of people gathered together and somebody sharing from the word. But you can, in a sense, preach or share with somebody else one-on-one, -on -one. maybe somebody at work, maybe somebody that you meet at the store. You can plant seeds of truth in many different environments. All of us, in a sense, are called to share our faith. Not everyone can get up and preach an evangelistic series, but we can all share what Jesus has done for us to somebody else. The gospel, of course, is good news. The first time that the word gospel was used, it was used by the Greek-speaking residents of Alexandria. They were dependent upon grain brought to them from Phoenicia or present-day Lebanon. And when these ships laden with grain made their way into the little harbor port, somebody would run through the city of Alexandria and proclaim the good news that the grain ships had arrived. This work of proclaiming the news that the grain ships had arrived eventually became known as gospel or the gospel, the proclaiming of good news. And how appropriate when the Bible writers were looking for a word to describe the good news that the living bread, Jesus, has come to this earth to give us life, they chose the word gospel meaning good news, good news. Now let me ask you, what is the good news that we have to share with the world today. Jesus. But there's many people sharing Jesus. What makes us different? What makes us unique? Well, let me see if we can briefly summarize what the gospel is. If you have your Bibles, you can take a look at it. Just two or three verses. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. It's kind of a funny place to go when you're looking for the gospel, to go to the Old Testament book of Ezekiel. But right here, in the heart of the book of Ezekiel, is one of the most clearest descriptions of what the gospel is. And you'll see as we read this verse, indeed, it's good news. It's very good news. Ezekiel chapter 36, and I'm looking at verse 26, 27. Uh, those two verses, I think, will... Well, let's start in verse 25, just to get the context. God is speaking to Israel. He's speaking to us. And He says, Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. In other words, God is promising forgiveness. Forgiveness, cleansing. From all of your filthiness, from all of your idols, I will cleanse you. So the first aspect of the gospel or the good news is forgiveness. Forgiveness from sin. It comes through Jesus. Christ's atoning sacrifice on the cross for us. We are forgiven. We are cleansed of our sins. But then verse 26 expands upon what this good news is all about. And God says, a new what I will give you. What does it say? A new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and to keep my judgments and do them. My friends, that is good news. God promises to put a new heart within us, to put His Spirit within us, to cause us to walk in His ways. Now what we need to understand is this. We are naturally born with a selfish bent towards self. In the Bible we find three words for sin. Three words. Sin, transgression, and iniquity. All are bad words. Now, the word sin literally means to miss the mark. God has set a standard and we've fallen short. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've missed the mark. That's what sin means. The word transgression means the breaking of God's law. Well, that's fairly simple. It's in the name transgress or to break. The word iniquity is an interesting word. It means a bent towards self. It's a bent towards self. It's that selfish inclination, that selfishness that we are born with. We don't have to teach our children to be selfish or self-centered. They just are. We have to teach them not to be selfish. It's that bend towards sin. It's summarized in the little book of 1 John. Sin is outlined in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. And we're talking about what it is that needs to change in our hearts. That's the gospel. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. The Apostle John writes, For all that is in the world, notice the three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The three things that we are naturally born with, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's in the natural carnal heart. 
The good news of the gospel is that somehow, don't ask me how, it's a miracle, a miracle of God's grace, somehow in the repenting, believing soul, someone who comes to Jesus, Jesus says, come unto me, all he that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Somehow in the believing heart, someone who confesses their sins to Jesus, the lust of the flesh is withdrawn by the Spirit of God and replaced with love for God. That's a miracle. The lust of the eyes is somehow taken out of the heart and replaced with the love for our fellow man. And the pride of life is taken away and replaced with a love for holiness. That's good news. No longer do we need to be motivated and controlled by selfishness or iniquity, but through God's mighty miracle of His grace, He is able to take a sinner and make a sinner into a saint. No longer do we try to be good. But we are good because God is changing us from the inside out. Is that good news? Sure, that's good news. That's great news. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you will be what? You shall be free indeed. You know, often I think it's easier for us to believe in the resurrection of the dead or to believe in some great miracle out there than to truly believe that God is able to change our hearts, to change our selfishness and pride and give us love obedience. Probably it's hard for us to believe that is because we know ourselves so well. We know how strong selfishness is. We know how strong the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is in our, in our own lives. And, and we think, Lord, it's, it's almost impossible for you to change my heart. It's easier for you to do some big miracle on the outside, but for you to really change me, I don't know. That, I think that's too hard. God can do it. Amen. That's why the apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation. See, Paul had seen the gospel work in his life. He knew what the gospel can do. And he had seen the gospel work in the lives of others. He knew that it was powerful, that it could change the human heart. That's why Paul was so excited. Friends, if, 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 we, if we don't believe the gospel, that God is able to do what He said He can do, that He can turn sinners into saints. He can change the hearts of human beings. Though your sins be as, as scarlet, they shall be what? As white as snow. They'll be red like crimson. They shall be as wool. If we don't really believe that God can do what He said He can do, then we won't be very excited to share the gospel. But if we are experiencing the power of Christ in our lives, then we've got something to share with somebody else. You see, the preaching, evangelism, is the preaching of the gospel. The good news, that Jesus can change a heart. And of course, the way He does that is through the atoning sacrifice in Calvary, through His death on our behalf. Well, there's two reasons why people don't like evangelists or evangelism, just people in general. And the reason is because of doomsayers and propagandists. They're trying to get you to do something that you don't want to do. Or they're prophesying of some terrible calamity that's coming upon the earth. and oh, People don't like that. We need to be careful that in our evangelism, in our sharing, we are actually sharing good news. And we have good news to share. I once came across this cartoon. I know you can't read it because the writing's very small, but let me see if I can read it for you. This gentleman over here, he's got a little Bible tract in his hand. And he says, hmm, that man looks like he needs a tract, a Bible tract. And so here this fellow is, he's smoking, he's drinking, he's, he's thinking shallow thoughts, shallow thoughts, shallow thoughts. And so our friend here jumps on the man and says, bonsai, believe or die. And he, he stuffs the tract down the man's throat. He says, take my tract and believe. And well, in alarm, the other man just takes off running. You must believe, he says. And he watches as the man disappears. Well, at least I sowed some seeds, he says. <laughs> How effective was this guy's evangelistic efforts? Do you think that person would ever want to hear anything more about what he has to say? You see, in our sharing of the good news, we are not trying to force somebody to do something they don't want to do. We're not trying to twist somebody's arm into doing something. Now, we cannot bring conversion. You know that, right? We cannot change the heart. Only the Spirit of God can change the heart of anyone. All we are called to do is to share the good news, to tell others what Jesus has done in our lives. Evangelism, in now in just a minute. There we go. It's such a joy to see you again here this morning. Those of you who were able to be here last night, and we began our Empowered Church training segment, and we'll be talking more about that this morning, talking about the evangelism cycle. But we want to do something just a little different right now. The focus is on mission and uh, what is happening in the area of reaching souls for the kingdom of heaven. As was mentioned, I work with Amazing Facts, and um, I thought I'd take just a few minutes to share with you a little bit as to what we are doing. 
uh, and some of the projects that we have coming up in the near future. It's very exciting for me to be here because I understand you have a three uh, ABN downlink radio station that's been broadcast right here throughout the town. And um, you can pick up Bible Answers Live, which Fabian Carey carries, I believe you can pick it up live on 2 o'clock on a Monday afternoon. That's 7 o'clock Pacific time. Pastor Doug Batchelor and myself do the Bible Answer Live program. So if you are so moved, you can call in. Call the number that we give you, and you can have a Bible question right there on the air. We get people calling us from all over the place, uh, as far away as Hong Kong, folks listening on the internet, and they'll give us a call, so we get different questions. So that's something you can share with your friends right here. You can tell them to tune in to uh, 3ABN Radio. I'm not sure what the frequency is. Does anyone know what, what the station is? 108. So you can tell them to tune in to 108 uh, on a... Any time's good, but in particular, you can invite them to turn in on a Tuesday, a Monday afternoon at 2 o'clock, and they can get Bible Answers live, and they can listen, maybe even participate if they so choose. Uh, Amazing Facts, as you know, is a growing ministry with a number of ways of trying to share the gospel with people. We have our radio program, which is Bible Answers Live. There's been some discussion of doing two programs per week instead of just one, a live program. And so that's in the works. That's probably going to happen, but not right away. There's some other things that's taking place. In September, we have a very exciting program called Here We Stand, Foundations of Our Faith. It is going to be a satellite event, a a night or 10 series program, 10 10 programs that Pastor Doug Batchelor will be doing, looking at the foundational principles of our faith. It'll be broadcast live on 3ABN from uh, Michigan, Lansing, Michigan. And in conjunction with that Here We Stand series, there is a special Empowered Church Training Symposium. It's going to be taking place. Uh, it's not going to be broadcast, but it's taking place in Lansing, Michigan. We have people coming in from across the country and even some other countries that are joining us for that training session and be covering a lot of the information that I'll be sharing with you here with that. So keep in mind, here we stand, Foundations of Our Faith. It begins the 7th of September. That is a Friday evening over there. I'm not sure what the time would be here. You'd probably have to tape it, but it would be a good thing to participate in. Here we stand, foundations of our faith. In Amazing Facts, we are looking at the ways in which we can communicate with people the love of Jesus and the gospel, and we're trying to use all the methods available to us. And so the internet is one area that we are really trying to use to share the gospel. We have the Amazing Facts website, which has just a uh, a wonderful resource of material on a number of important Bible topics. In addition to the Amazing Facts website, which we're in the process of updating, and and we should have the new website released sometime in September. There are also some other websites that Amazing Facts has. Uh, Here are some of them. The one is sabbathtruth.com, the website dedicated to the message of the Sabbath, and a number of important articles there and some good information for people. There's another one called helltruth.com that talks about what happens to the wicked. And how God is a God of mercy and a God of love, even in the destruction of the wicked. Helltruth.com. We have another website, thetruthaboutdeath.com. It deals with the subject of the state of the dead. So we have these websites. There's others. I can't remember all of them. Bibleuniverse.com is another important one that we have that you can go to. Or Bible Answers to different things. Bible Answers Live is a website you can go. It'll link you to the Amazing Facts website if you look on Google. And you can get archived programs of Bible Answers and so on, as well as free articles, sermons by Pastor Doug and Joe Cruz and so on. So uh, the Internet is an area that we're really trying to expand in ministry, to share with others. In addition to our Internet ministry, we also have television programming. And our goal this year, and we're well on track, is to get 80,000 responses from our television program. So what that means is we'll broadcast these programs, people will then have an opportunity to call the number on the screen that they see for a free offer, which is a book or a study dealing with the topic that Pastor Doug was presenting. And uh, people who contact us, they call this number, they get the free offer, we get their information. And we're, our goal is 80,000 people calling this year asking for the free offer. So far, we got 60,000. So we're well on way to get 80,000 for the year. That's a lot of names. That's a lot of interest. That's a lot of context of people wanting to learn more understand the Bible truths of Scripture. We also have the Bible School, the Amazing Facts Bible School. It's online. You can do the lessons if you wish online. We have uh, thousands of people enrolled in the online Bible School. We're just in the process now of upgrading our Bible School program. That Those who um, do the correspondent program of our Bible School through the mail, 
not only will they receive a lesson, but they'll also receive a DVD uh, that goes along with that lesson of Pastor Doug presenting on whatever that topic might be. Our goal is to try to give people the best opportunity that they can have. Hear the Advent message, make a decision for Jesus. We're trying to use as many different avenues of outreach and sharing to different people in the community. So these are some of our areas of ministry that we are expanding through the television, through radio, through our Bible school. We also have AFCO, which is the Amazing Facts Center of Evangelism. It is a four-month training program. We have about 30 to 35 students who come through that. We do the program twice a year, one in the spring, one in the fall. And, um, of course, that's backwards here. And uh, we, we're going into our, we, we in our um, full program right now. We've just started it. It goes for four months. And during that time period, students are trained in four basic areas. Bible work, uh, pastoral work, lay pastoral work health ministries, and then also in public preaching. People who want to become evangelists or do full-time evangelism. So it's a four-month training program that we offer there. And uh, we have about 35 or 36 students. So through the different avenues, our goal is to try and reach as many people for the kingdom of God as we possibly can. You see, we believe that Jesus is coming soon. Amen? He's coming soon, and we want to do everything that we can to reach people for the kingdom of God. We get stories of people all the time. Someone was one day on the internet looking for some worms. He, he's a fisherman, and he wanted to get some worms to go fishing. Somehow, he typed in something, and he ended up getting the Amazing Facts website. And he started studying the Bible lessons and actually found a local Adventist church and became an Adventist. I'm looking for worms on the internet, and he ended up finding... Adventist contacts, and we get all kinds of incredible stories of people who somehow turned the radio on at just the right time and they heard something they'd never heard before. And God is using these different means and methods of reaching people. So I'd encourage you, utilize the resources that you can. I'm so glad you've got the radio station here. Follow up on that and try and share with people the websites so that they can go and gather more information. And whatever we can do to advance God's cause, that's really what it's all about, sharing the gospel with the world. Well, that's just a quick update. We'll be sharing more about the Empowered Church program in just a few minutes. We wanted to give you an idea of what's been happening in Amazing Facts and some of the things that we've been doing. Last night we spoke about the biblical piece of evangelism. Why do we do evangelism? This morning, during our Sabbath school time, I would like to talk about what I think is one of the most important things that the church do in the area of evangelism. We're going to be talking about the evangelism cycle. Evangelism cycle. We're going to be talking about a framework for evangelist planning and success. Uh, we know that this works because this is Christ's method, as you're going to find out here in a moment. In churches that have implemented an ongoing evangelist cycle, God has blessed in a remarkable way. There is a church not too far from where I live in Northern California. It's a small church, and they contacted us and asked we would help them set up an ongoing evangelist cycle. Work with the Empowered Church program. I said we could do that, and we tried to visit with them. And when I arrived there, a Sabbath morning, my first Sabbath in this little church, there were about 10 people, and the youngest person there was 80. So it was an old church. They had no children, no young families. They didn't have any children program Sabbath morning for Sabbath school because there were no kids. And they said, we want to grow. They looked at what was happening and said, our church is literally dying off, and if we're going to survive, something has to happen. And uh, their heart, though, was in the right place. Before we had even arrived there, those those saints had gathered together every Sabbath and began praying, asking the Lord to move in that community, do something special. So one of the first things that we did with this church was set up an ongoing cycle. And the church, this was about a year and a half ago, uh, they did an evangelistic series of meetings. They began to connect with other church and community. Uh, and the Lord is blessed in a remarkable way. Two Sabbaths ago, I was there, and there were 85 people jammed into this little church. When they do the children's story, the front pew is packed with kids, on Adventist kids, sitting here on the platform in front. So all of the children divisions are up and running. They're starting an adventure group and a pathfinder group and, and the folks are amazed at what God has done in that community in that church simply because they followed Christ's prescribed method if we do what God has asked us to do he will work in a most remarkable way so I'd like to share with you the evangelism cycle the framework for evangelistic planning is the inspiration for the evangelism cycle it comes from the book ministry of healing and it's describing Christ's method of outreach. Listen, it's so so important, these words. Ellen White writes, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. Now, how many methods will work according to this quotation? What's that word? Alone. Christ's method alone. So how many methods? Well, there's one that really works. It's Christ's method. Then she goes on to tell us exactly what Christ's method is. Christ's method alone will give true success. You see, it might appear as though a group is having success because there might be many people coming. But what happens 10 years down the line? Are the people still there? Are the people connected? True success comes from Christ's method. Notice what he did. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. It's the first thing Jesus did. He mingled with people. Secondly, he showed his sympathy for them 
He ministered to their needs. He won their confidence. And then he said, follow me. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. He mingled with people, ministered to their needs, sympathized with them. He won their confidence. And only when he had won their confidence, then he was able to say to them, follow me. So if we look at Christ's method, and we put it sort of in a little graph, and we, we boil it down to just the essence, the first thing that we find Jesus doing is making friends. He made friends with people. He connected with them. He ministered to their needs, and he won their confidence through his healing ministry. He showed the people his sympathy and his love for them. And when he won their confidence, then and then only, he was able to share the word or share the truths that he had come to give. Now, if we look at these three areas, making friends, winning confidence, and sharing the word, we want to ask ourselves the question, where are we as Adventists typically really strong? in these three areas. It is making friends, winning people's confidence, or sharing the word. Where, where are we typically strong? Now, before you answer, let me say, I, I've had an opportunity to travel all over the place doing the same seminar, not only in North America, but even over in Europe. And I always ask this question when I come to this slide. Where do you think we as Adventists are the strongest in these three areas? And so far, I've always gotten the same answer. So let's see if things are the same here in New Zealand as everywhere else. Where do, you, where do you think we as Adventists are the best, the strongest? Making friends, winning people's confidence, or sharing the word? What do you think? Sharing the word or making friends? How many think sharing the word? How many think making friends? All right, well, the majority say sharing the word, and you write online with everybody else. <laughs> That's the same answer we get, and I think it's right. The reason being is we are very good when it comes to presenting our fundamental beliefs. We've got all the proof texts lined up just right. And nobody can really fault us in our doctrinal belief. It's solidly scriptural. It's on the Word. And when it comes to doing evangelistic series or evangelistic campaigns, we've got it all taken care of. We've got greeters. We've got children's program. We've got people who do special music. It's all taken care of. We've got special slides that go along with our presentations. We present the three angels' messages. When it comes to sharing the Word, I don't think there's anyone or any group that can match how effective we are in sharing the Word. That's good. Amen. It's important to share the word. We must never lose that. Evangelism is, is the lifeblood of the church. But in order to share the word, you need to have people there to share the word with. So then that brings us to the other two, making friends or winning people's confidence. Out of the two, making friends or winning people's confidence, where do you think we are the weakest as a church? Making friends or winning people's confidence? What do you think? Winning people's confidence? I think it's sort of 50-50. It can go either way. But... I think in the most case, it's this, winning people's confidence. In other words, we have people that we know that we work with, maybe colleagues from work or even family members who don't believe the message or whatever the case might be, and we, we know them, we're acquainted to them, we have friends. But the question that we often ask ourselves is, how do we move from just friendship and secular conversations to spiritual things? How do we begin to win people's confidence so that they'll be willing to hear what we have to say about the truths of Scripture. So one of the weak areas that we have, I think, is this one, winning people's confidence. We know people for a long time, and uh, we just want to, how can we break through to them? How can we meet a spiritual need? I'd like to share with you some ways in which you can do that this afternoon, all right? How do we connect with people? How do we win their confidence? But that is very important, winning people's confidence so we can share the Word. We'll give you some specific pointers this afternoon as we go through that. Now, if we follow Christ's method, we see three main areas in the public ministry of Jesus. The first phase is to prepare. We have the ministry of John the Baptist who went before Jesus preparing the way for Christ. We have the 12 disciples that Jesus sent out. And then in Matthew chapter 10, you have 70 others that Jesus sent out. And these disciples went out into the villages and the towns and they prepared the way for Jesus. After the disciples went out and preached and prepared the way, then we find Jesus coming, and he went to those same cities where the disciples had preached. Jesus came and reaped the harvest. He preached the word. So we find the preparation, then we find the preaching, and the third phase in Christ's ministry is the preserving. Not only did the disciples go plant the seed and Jesus reap the harvest, but in the book of Acts, we have the history of the early Christian church which was Christ's method of preserving those who had received Him as their personal Savior. Now, there's a very interesting parable that you find in Luke chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, you can take a look at this. Luke chapter 10, it's the parable that we refer to as the Good Samaritan. Luke chapter 10, verse 29. 
Let's start in verse 28 to get the context. Well, actually, we better start in verse 25 if you really want to get the context. It says, And behold, a certain lawyer came and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, let me ask you, was that a good question or was that a bad question? What shall I do to inherit eternal life? It was a good question. His motive, though, was questionable because he was trying to tempt Jesus or test or twist Christ's words somehow. Well, Jesus answers by asking him a question. What is written in the law? How readest thou? The man answered and said he had an understanding somewhat of the spiritual nature of the law. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength, and you ought to love your neighbor as yourself. Listen to what Jesus said. And he said unto him, thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. Now, by the way, it is impossible for us of ourselves to love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind. You know that, don't you? It is impossible for a sinful human being to love his neighbor as himself. Our only hope of fulfilling this commandment is to have the power of Christ within, right? Jesus working within, that new life from above. Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again. That's this born again, a change of motive, a change of purpose, no longer governed by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, but now we are motivated by love for God, love for others, and a love for holiness. Then the man, willing to justify himself, verse 29, said to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Jesus responded by telling the story of the Good Samaritan. He said, A certain man went from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell amongst thieves, and he was stripped of his raiment. Notice what happened to him. He was stripped of his raiment, he was wounded, and left half dead. Now, what does raiment represent in the Bible? What does clothing represent? It represents character, right? Our raiment is as filthy as rags. Our righteousness is as filthy rags, but Jesus promises to give us his spotless robe of righteousness, right? So here is a man traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he falls amongst thieves who strip him of his raiment. Now this parable has some very significant points to it. This poor traveler represents the human race as a whole. The thieves that stripped him of his raiment and left him half dead represents Satan, way back there in the Garden of Eden. Because of disobedience, Adam and Eve lost their righteousness and they were doomed to die. They were left dead. Does that make sense? Half dead. And then it goes on and it says, And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Well, the reason the priest didn't stop and help him, if the man was dead, perchance, and the priest touched the man, he would be ceremonially unclean. He wouldn't be able to go do his work. So he made religion an obstacle to doing what God really would have wanted him to do, right? Can we today sometimes make religion an obstacle to doing what God really wants us to do? Sure we can. Sure we can. Then it says, a Levite came by, and he looked upon the man, but he passed by on the other side. The Levite represents the whole ceremonial service and law, which pointed to Jesus. And Jesus is highlighting here that the ceremonial law, the sacrificial system in and of itself could not cleanse a sinner. They all pointed to Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of that. John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Only Jesus can cleanse and make someone whole. Then in verse 34 of 35, it says, But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, what is that next word? He had what? Compassion upon him. I love that word. The motivation of the good Samaritan is compassion. He saw this man dying, wounded, stripped of his garment, and the Good Samaritan had compassion. When Jesus looked at our world, we looked at Adam and Eve way back in the garden, representing the whole human race, fallen snared to Satan's devices, stripped of our righteousness, doomed to death, God looked upon us and had compassion. He couldn't leave us. He couldn't just walk away. And so we find here the Good Samaritan comes to the man, and notice what he does to him. He says he bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to the inn and took care of him. Now what does oil and wine represent in the Bible? Oil represents the Holy Spirit, right? And wine, what does wine represent? The atoning sacrifice of Jesus. Through Christ's death on Calvary, where he shed his blood for our sins, we have forgiveness of sin. We are justified, is the theological term. But not only does Jesus take care of our past, and put us in a position where we stand before God as though we have never sinned, but He also gives us of His Holy Spirit that works within us both to will and to 
do according to his good pleasure. That's the oil, that's the Holy Spirit. So the good Samaritan pours in oil and wine, and as a result, the man is clothed somehow, probably with the garment of the good Samaritan. We are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. And the good Samaritan takes this man to the inn. He takes care of the man there in the inn. And then we read over here, verse 35, it says, And on the morrow he departed. And he took two pence, and he gave it to the host, the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him until I come again, and if you spend anything more, I will repay you. Now, where does Jesus take those who he has saved by his blood and empowered by his spirit, where does he place them? He places them in the church. In the parable, the inn represents the church. The innkeepers are you and I. Those whom Christ has saved by his blood, he places in the church and he tells us, take care of them. I've given you abilities and gifts and talents and resources. Utilize these gifts and resources to strengthen and help these new believers. And then Jesus gives the promise, if you spend any extra or put forth any effort that I haven't given you, I will repay you when I come again. The work that God has called us to do is to take care of those who have been saved by his blood. He brings us into the church. The church is the inn to take care of those who have fallen prey to the devil's deceptions. This third phase in the ministry of Christ is this preserve phase. It's very important. You see, our work in sharing the gospel with others does not end at the baptistry. In reality, it only begins at the baptistry. When a person is baptized, they are spiritually born again. And a newborn babe must be placed in a caring, compassionate family, otherwise it will not survive. So likewise, someone who receives Jesus as their personal Savior, they need to be placed in a caring, compassionate church family. It's going to nurture them and encourage them and walk with them because they will face opposition. Remember, the devil hates it when a person makes his stand for Jesus. And he's going to do everything that he possibly can to try and discourage those new believers. We need to walk with them. We need to encourage them. We need to be patient with them. We need to pick them up when they fall. Does that make sense? We're the innkeepers. We are to take care of those whom Christ has saved and brought to us. That's why this preserving phase is very important. Another word that we use for this preserving is discipleship, the importance of discipleship. We'll talk more about that as well. So if we look at these three main areas, preparation, that's personal work, connecting with people in the community, winning their confidence, we have sharing the word, that's the public presentation of the word, and then we have the nurturing of the new believers. That's this discipleship component, and then the cycle needs to keep going. Often we stop, we go through one time and then we take a break for a few years and then we try and do it again, then we have to start from scratch. But if we continue one cycle after another cycle after another cycle, there are some people that will come to one evangelistic series who will not make a decision for Jesus at that series of meetings. And if we wait for another 12 months before we give them another opportunity to make a decision, the promptings of the Holy Spirit is waning. Does that make sense? They might not respond. But if we follow up with another evangelistic series within the next six months, it doesn't have to be a real big one, if we give people another opportunity to make a decision for Jesus. I remember there was one man that came to our church's evangelistic series, and the first series, he just sat there with his arms folded the whole time. When it came time to fill out a card, would you like to be baptized? Would you like to join the Advent Church? He wrote there in big, bold letters, No, I am Roman Catholic, and he actually put, belonged to the Holy Roman Catholic Church. He wrote that in the card. So we thought, oh, well, you know, there it is. He's pretty clear on what he believes. But for some reason, when we did another evangelistic series, he showed up again. Oh, that's strange. And we went through the meetings, and it came time to hand out the cards, and we handed out the cards, and we said, do you want to join the church? And this time it wasn't as bold, but he still wrote Roman Catholic. Never change, or whatever. And out. Well, we did another series, and he came to that one. And another one, he must have come to about five. But sooner or later, eventually, he made his decision. He said, I see it now. I see the truth. And he made his stand and joined the church. If we just stopped after one evangelistic series and said, oh, he had his chance, you know, now it's off our shoulders, it's on his head, head he would have never made a decision to become part of God's remnant church. So keeping this cycle going is very important. I want to talk briefly about the harvest cycle as we go through it. There's a little parable that i like to share. Um, Imagine a farmer who decides to grow wheat. And so he goes to the library and he gets books on wheat and he figures out what type of fertilizer he needs to put in the ground and what is the water content, what the pH balance of the soil must be. And so he does all of these things. He plows up his field and then he waits for his wheat to grow, but nothing happens. All of his friends, all of their farms around him, 
they have little sprouts of green wheat growing, but nothing, just black dirt is all he has. He can't figure out why his wheat's not growing. So one day he goes to his farmer friends and he says to them, I don't understand why my wheat's not growing. So they all jump into their, their pickup trucks and they drive out to his farm and there the farmers walk out into his field surrounded by beautiful emerald green fields. And here is just this, this black field that he has. And well, they pick up the soil and they feel it and they say, why, the pH balance, did you check? What type of fertilizer did you use? And he says that they scratch their heads. They can't figure out why this farmer is not having any wheat. Finally, somebody says, well, what type of seed did you plant anyway? And with that, our farmer friend looks down and kicks a clot of dirt, and he says, well, I prayed for wheat, I hoped for wheat, but I guess I didn't plant any seed. Now, of course, that's not a true story. <laughs> no farmer would expect to have wheat without planting the seed, right? It's just a law of nature. You can't receive a harvest without planting seed. However, sometimes in the church, we end up doing what that very farmer does. We don't plant any seeds in the community, and we put out a few flies, and we expect everybody to kind of show up. But they don't know who we are. They don't know that what we have to say is important or that it's going to make a difference in their life. And so we do some big evangelistic series, and nobody comes from the community, and the people get real discouraged, and they say, we spend all this money, you know, all this time and all this effort. Evangelism just doesn't work. That's the last time we do an evangelistic series. Well, nothing wrong with the evangelistic series. The problem is, is we didn't plant the seed. The evangelistic meeting is the harvest, not the planting. Does that make sense? If we want to be effective in evangelism, every single phase must be in place. And we look at these key six phases. Here they are. The first phase in effective evangelism is personal preparation. We cannot give what we do not have. So it's personal preparation. Second phase is preparing the soil. That's connecting with people in the community. Third phase is sowing the seed. That's planting seeds of truth through Bible study, through literature distribution, and so on. Cultivating that relationship with the people. And then you have the harvesting. That's the actual evangelistic event itself. Then you have the preserving of the harvest. That's the discipling of the new believers. That's taking care of them in the end, right? Often people who make a decision for Christ and join the church, they have friends and family members who are asking questions saying, man, why has this person joined this group? You know, there's changes in that person's life. What's happening? Those friends and neighbors are wonderful prospects to bring to your next evangelistic series. But if you wait for too long, their interest wanes and they don't count. Typically, when people become Adventists, you give them two or three years, and then most of their friends are Adventists. And they don't have any non-Adventist friends that they really meet, mingle with or, or know well. So we want to follow up on these evangelistic meetings. Okay, here we have our different phases again. You have the planting of the seed, cultivating that seed, winning people's confidence. confidence. You have the harvesting. You have the preserving of the harvest, the discipleship. And then you have the cycle repeating, winning people's confidence, preparing the soil, and the idea is to keep this cycle going. It's really what we want to do. Let's take a closer look at each of these six phases. The first phase then is personal preparation. Some of the things that we could include in this first phase of personal preparation is revival. Revival in the church, prayer, planning, training programs for the church, developing a church mission centered around the gospel commission. You know, before Christ's ascension, he said to his disciples, he said, take the gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Teach, baptize, disciple. And here were just this small group of followers. And there they gathered in the upper room, burdened with this commission that Jesus had just given them to take the gospel to the whole world. And they must have thought to themselves, how in the world are we going to do this? How can we, just this small group with all the prejudice that's out there, how are we going to take the gospel to all the world? And when they realized that it was impossible for them to do this on their own, they got down on their knees and they started to pray. And their prayer was, Lord, empower us to do the work that you've called us to do. They were burdened with the desire to reach souls for the kingdom. And when they gathered together in one accord, asking for power to do the work of evangelism, the Holy Spirit came upon the people. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they turned the world upside down. So personal preparation is where it starts. Gathering together and saying, Lord, how can we reach this community for you? How can we reach this province? How can we reach this nation? I'm reminded of the great uh, reformer, John Knox, who prayed, Lord, give me Scotland or I die. Burdened with the passion of reaching people, Jesus. That fire 
that kindled in the heart of the disciples, that love for souls must be our experience. That comes from prayer. Gathering together, planning, developing this mission statement, and beginning to move forward as God leads. Now, in this evangelism cycle, there are certain harvest indicators. Now, what we mean by harvest indicators, these are things that we can see that will tell us if we are ready to move to the next phase of the evangelism cycle. In other words, when you're growing tomatoes in your garden, there are certain things you look for to know what to do. There might be a certain um, type, maybe the leaves are not growing just right, or the coloration is wrong. You know you need to add a certain type of fertilizer. And when the tomatoes reach a certain size or a certain color, then you know it's time to pick them or do something. And so there are these certain harvest indicators that tell you when you are ready to move on to the next phase of the evangelism cycle. So the first phase is personal preparation. It's revival. It's coming together. It's uniting on the purpose of saving souls for the kingdom. And there are certain harvest indicators. Here they are. The spirituality and practical Christian experience of the individuals within the church family. Unity of the church. Is there a strong unity amongst the members of the church? Is there a, a practical Christian experience? Is Jesus working in our lives? Are we fully consecrated to Him? Also, is the mission of the church centered around reaching others with the gospel. Is that the burden that we have, to tell others about Jesus? That's what we want to have developed in this first phase. Well, then that moves us to phase two, which is preparing the soil. And here are some of the programs that we do in connecting with people in the community. You've got your community service programs, cooking seminars, smoking, stress. Uh, by the way, a big one today is family seminars, relationship seminars especially parenting seminars. People want to know, how do we raise our kids in the world today? And doing these felt need seminars is very effective in breaking down prejudice in the community, winning people's confidence, and awakening an interest in spiritual things. You also begin to advertise for Bible studies. You can do that, you know, internet Bible studies, mail, door hangers. There are so many different things that you can do to try and connect with people in the community. Harvest indicators for phase two to know how you're doing. Number of positive relationships between church, the church, and the community. Does the community know that the Seventh-day Adventist church even exists in this town? And if the Seventh-day Adventist church was taken away today, would anybody in the community really care? See, we want to be a positive force in the community. There was a little church in the state of Kansas, and uh, just a small little church in this small town. Nobody even knew about the Adventist church, just a few old folks there. But they had a pastor who came in there, and he had big dreams and big ideas. And he asked the church, he said, does anyone in the community really know who we are or what we believe or what we stand for? And the folks said, no, probably not. They said, well, let's do something to tell the community that we really care about them. Well, this was after 9-11, and of course, firemen were you know, really held up, brave, and so on. So he said, let's have a special Sabbath where we can thank our local fire department, our volunteer fire department, for the work that they do. And I thought that was a great idea. So somebody went down to the little town hall, and he looked up a little bit of a history of the fire department. And he got some great stories of the past of fires that happened in that town and what the firemen did and the firemen who gave their lives in trying to rescue people and so on. And he put this together. They got some pictures and they put a PowerPoint up and everything else. And then they advertised it in the community. And they said, on a certain Sabbath, we're going to thank, we're going to honor our fire department. Please come. And the local newspaper ran it. They invited the mayor to come. Of course, they invited the fire department to be there and they asked them to come in with their fire trucks and to wear their uniforms and everything. And it was a, a big deal. And finally, the day came. And of course, the little church was packed with people in the community. And the mayor was there. And the fire engines came up with their sirens. And all of the firemen got out and they piled out. And they came and they sat there in the front pew of the church. And the pastor got up and he, he said, we just want to thank the fire department for the work that they're doing in our community. We really appreciate the hard work that they do. And the mayor got up and said, you know, we want to thank the Seventh-day Adventist Church for hosting this. We appreciate that. And then the pastor began with his sermon. And he started his sermon by telling a story that had happened in that community to that fire department several years earlier of a fire in a building and one of the firemen who went in to rescue someone and ended up giving up his life in order to save somebody else. And he segued right into Jesus who left the glories of heaven and came to this earth and gave up his life in order to save us. At the end of the sermon, he invited the fire chief to come forward and receive a little plaque that they had put together of appreciation, 
from the local Seventh-day Adventist church. And here this big, burly fire chief gets up and comes and stands behind the podium and the pastor hands him this plaque. The fire chief wants to say a few words, but he's so choked up he can hardly say anything. Tears begin to swell up in his eyes and he says, no one in this community has ever done anything like this for us. Well, needless to say, from then on, everybody in that town knew about the Seventh-day Adventist church. And people would go to the little grocery store to buy their groceries and they'd be in the checkout line and somebody would turn to them and say, hey, are you a member of the Seventh-day Adventist church? Oh man, I read the article in the paper of what you guys did for the fire department. That's just fantastic. And just shortly after this, the church advertised a cooking school that the little church is going to do in the community, and that cooking school was packed with people because now they knew about the Adventists. They knew that the Adventists were caring people, people concerned about the community. Does that make sense? They made a difference. They impacted the community. Now, you can't always do the same thing, but we want to find ways in which we can impact the community so the people in town know that we care about them. You've heard the little saying, Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. That is true. If we expect people to come and listen to what we have to say about theology, we need to show them that we care about them as a whole. We're concerned about their family. We're concerned about their health. We're concerned about their emotional stability, whatever the case might be. We want to be there to help people. So this second phase is very important, connecting with people in the community, winning their confidence. All right, the third phase then is planting seed. Planting seed. That's sharing your personal testimony with people that you interact with. That's drop-off Bible studies, video Bible studies, personal Bible studies, small group Bible studies, literature and books and Christian radio television. In this planting phase, one of the biggest things that you can do before your evangelistic series is to try and get as many Bible studies in the community as you possibly can. The more Bible studies you have in the community, the greater will be your results in your evangelistic series. And this is how the two work together. Sitting at somebody's home at their kitchen table opening the Bible uh, has a certain power, sharing the Word. But when it comes to calling for a decision, it's difficult for people to make big decisions when you're sitting in their home doing a Bible study with them. But if you can get that person to come to an evangelistic series and they can hear all of the truths of Scripture presented one after another after another and they can see the big picture and the Holy Spirit is there to impress the heart. You know, the Bible speaks about the foolishness of preaching. There is power in the preaching of God's Word. When they see the big picture, they are far more likely to make a positive decision for the truth and for Jesus in a public evangelistic setting than they are if they're just sitting home and you're doing Bible studies with them. So what we try to do is get as many Bible studies taking place in the community. And then just before the evangelistic meetings begin, we transition those Bible study interests in the home and invite them to come to the evangelistic series. Another thing that we do is when our church members go out and give Bible studies, we ask them, don't present the Sabbath truth in the person's home. All you'll need to do is present the first four or five lessons. That's it. You don't get into the Sabbath. You talk about the Bible. You talk about salvation. You don't get into the Sabbath. The goal is to transition to the evangelistic series just before the Sabbath truth is presented in the home. So you don't even have to deal with that. You just simply awaken interest, planting seeds, winning confidence, breaking down prejudice. That's what the Bible studies are all about. So the more Bible studies you have in the community, you can invite those interests to come to your evangelistic series. And you can say, well, Pastor, I can't do that. You know, I, I could never do a Bible study. Remember, all you've got to do is just the first four. It's all written out there for you. All you do is open the Bible and read the verse. It's all. You don't have to ask them to join the Adventist church or to start keeping the Sabbath. That, don't worry about that. All you do is the first four or five lessons, win their confidence, and then when the evangelistic meeting comes, you say to them, you know, we have this great prophecy seminar taking place at our church. You will love it. Will you come as my guest? Come be my friend to these series of meetings. The people come to the evangelistic meetings, and then you leave it up to God to impress upon the hearts of those the things that they are hearing. That's the way we use these Bible studies. All right, certain harvest indicators, the amount of direct spiritual outreach by the church towards the community. In other words, how many Bible studies are taking place in the community before the beginning of your evangelistic meeting. The more Bible studies, the more people will come to your evangelistic meeting, the more baptisms you'll have at the end. It's just simple, all right? Our next phase then is cultivating the harvest, and that's continuing these Bible studies transitioning to your home or to a neutral place. In some cases, it's the evangelistic meeting then at this point in time. 
You want to conduct what we call some bridging events just before the evangelistic meeting begins. Probably the one month before the evangelistic meetings begin. You want to start connecting with people in the community, do some health seminars or something, and then you can invite them at that seminar to come to the evangelistic meeting. In the little church that I'd spoken about earlier that has grown dramatically over the past year or so, they followed the same plan and they did a cooking school. They invited people from the community to come. And the last night of the cooking school, they asked me to come because I was doing the evangelistic meetings for that church. They asked me to come and invite the people to come to the evangelistic meeting. So at the end of the cooking school, we did a nice segue into the one who was doing the meetings. He introduced me, and they gave people an opportunity to sign up right then and there for the evangelistic meetings that were beginning a week from there. And a number of people came from that cooking school to the evangelistic meeting, and uh, we've had some baptisms from people as a result who came to the cooking school. They would have never come to the evangelistic meeting if they hadn't first gone to the cooking school. But when they came to the cooking school and they heard what we had to say, they said, well, maybe, maybe these people are okay. You know, maybe they're not as crazy as uh, I first thought. And so they ended up coming to hear what the Bible truths are. And they made their decision. So that's what we mean by these bridging events. Certain harvest indicators, the number of consistent in-home Bible studies given, and the number of people attending your bridging events. If you have a high number of Bible studies in the community given by church members and you have a large number of people coming to your bridging events, then you are ready for your evangelistic crusade, all right? You will be guaranteed an audience if you have Bible studies and you have a good number of people coming to your bridging events. And of course, your next phase, that's the harvesting phase. That's a strong message where you appeal for decisions. You ask people to make their stand for Jesus. That's public evangelistic seminar at the church, or if you can't do a live series, do a video evangelistic series. You can have a series of revival meetings. If people don't come to your evangelistic meetings, but you are doing Bible studies with them in the home, then you want to continue those Bible studies. Then, of course, you need to present the Sabbath and all the other truths, but you want to call them to make a decision for Jesus in the home. If they don't come to the evangelistic meeting, your first priority is to try and get them to come to the meetings. If they don't come to the meetings, then you continue with the Bible studies in the people's homes. And uh, use whatever means is available. If you can get a live person, that's always best. You know, but if you, are, if you can't do that every time, do a video series or do some sort of a net thing or you know, even just pop in a DVD and share these things with people. But you need to have some sort of evangelistic reaping event. A harvest indicator is get a crowd, the number of non-members attending the public seminar. The more visitors you have opening night, the better will be the results at the end of the evangelistic meeting. If you only have two non having a shop at your evangelistic series, uh, and you have one of them make a decision for Jesus. Fantastic. That's 50%. That's extremely good. Praise God for that. Now, if you have 50 people showing up, you might want to expect six baptisms or 10 baptisms, and that's fantastic. If you get six baptisms from 50 opening night, you can praise the Lord. Those are fantastic statistics, okay? So praise the Lord for that. The more people you can get opening night, the better will be, be the results at the end. You have a lot of people that come to evangelistic meetings just out of curiosity. They're not really interested. People who aren't spiritual, but they just want to see what this is about. And so you're going to have a large number of fallout. You're looking for those who the Holy Spirit has been working on. Remember, you can't convert anyone. You can just share the word. The Holy Spirit has been working on people's hearts and bringing them to that point of decision. Some people coming to the evangelistic meeting might not make a decision at that meeting, but six months down the line, they might be ready to make a decision at another series of meetings. And so we don't want to keep, want to keep the cycle going. We don't want to quit. Um, then, of course, the final phase, preserving the harvest. That's spiritual weekly study opportunities for those new believers including a deeper understanding of truths and Christian experience. We want something called spiritual mentors. And this is why we encourage all new people who join the church to have somebody who is going to become that person's spiritual mentor. Basically, it's their spiritual friend, someone who will encourage them, someone who will pray with them, someone who will meet with them on a regular basis. And there's different things that you can do. I'll share more about this this afternoon. But we want to make sure that people who make a decision for Jesus have the support of the church family to encourage them through those difficult times. Remember after the children of Israel left Egypt, God miraculously opened up the Red Sea. They passed through baptism. But when they arrived on the other side, did they set foot right away in the promised land? No, they had a whole wilderness to go. And when a person is baptized, they're not immediately raptured out to heaven, but they have to live in this world. They have to walk through the wilderness, right? 
They need the support of the church to encourage them. By the way, we need the support of each other. No man is an island. But we're in this together. Amen? We want to encourage each other. I don't want to sit and laugh when I watch your side of the boat go down. Because I'm also in the boat, right? When somebody falls, we want to lift them up. We are family. We are brothers and sisters working together towards the same goal. So we want to give people an opportunity to study deeper. And there's a whole big section on discipleship that we can talk about at some later point in time. Um, Harvest indicator, the practical Christian experience of the new believers. Are they actually growing? Are they growing in their relationship with Christ? Now, very quickly, why are the results so often small in evangelism? We hear people say, well, evangelism just doesn't work. We've tried evangelism. People just come in the front door and they go out the back door. Have you ever heard something like this before? Uh, We spent all kinds of money and no one was baptized. These are sometimes the things we hear. (laughs) We did an evangelistic series once in the church. And uh, halfway through the evangelistic series, one of the dear saints in the church turned to one of her friends and said, man, I can't wait for this evangelistic meeting to be over so that we can have our church back. (laughs) She wasn't very excited about evangelism. (laughs) She said, all these new people coming in this church. I can't wait until they leave when we have our church back. (laughs) That's the wrong attitude when it comes to evangelism, right? You want to be growing. You want to be sharing. And sometimes it's difficult. And I, I'm so grateful for this little church I'd spoken about earlier. Of these, these saints, they've put up with so much. We've had all kinds of people attend the church. and Kids that have never sat for more than 10 minutes still. And now they're coming to church for a whole hour. And the parents don't know how to teach their children to sit still in church. But the saints have been so gracious, so kind, so patient. And the Lord's blessed, and the church is growing, and people are making decisions. But it takes effort on our part to nurture these new believers into the church. All right, three reasons why evangelism doesn't work. Number one, we don't plant enough seeds, so we reap what we sow. We don't prepare for the harvest. That's probably the biggest reason why evangelism doesn't work. Do you see the importance and significance of planting seeds? Very important. Listen to this verse, 2 Corinthians 9, 6. But this I say, he which sows sparingly shall reap also sparingly, And he which sows bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Be not deceived, God says. Whatsoever a man sows, he shall also reap. Now, of course, we refer to this as our own lives, right? We reap what we sow. But in a broader broader way, that's true of the church. We reap what we sow. If we're not sowing the gospel seed, we're not going to reap a harvest. Some people say, well, we send out evangelistic brochures, you know. We send out a mailing, we put up a few posters. Friends, you can't bank on handbills anymore. In the old days, you could send out handbills and people would come. But today, people are bombarded, just bombarded with all kinds of things. Uh, You know, their mailboxes are full with ads for different things. People are bombarded with the media. They don't respond the way they used to do handbills. Now, go ahead and use handbills because there's always one or two, you know, that the Holy Spirit will move on. But you can't bank on that. We actually like to know who's going to be at our opening night's meeting, in our evangelistic meeting, before we even send out any handbills. Just from the contacts that have been made by the church, the number of Bible studies, the number of people coming to the bridging events. Uh, If you get 1% response to your handbills, you are doing extremely well, just the way it is. Now, I don't know what it's like in New Zealand. I'm giving some statistics from the North American division, but it's tough. I mean, if you get 1%, um, it's actually 1 per 1,000. And bill sent out. If you get one per, per thousand, so that's more than one percent. If you get one per thousand, you're doing very, very well at opening night. So don't bank on handles. Go ahead and use them, but recognize the greatest success in evangelism is planting seeds, planting seeds in the community. In the morning, the Bible says, sow seed, and in the evening, withhold not thine hand. Notice the next part, for thou knowest not whether shall prosper, either this or that, or whether both shall be alike good. You don't know what the Holy Spirit's going to do. You don't know where the person is. Just go ahead and witness. Sow the seed. Allow the Lord to increase the harvest. We think of the funnel mentality. Here are all of the people that you're connecting with in the community. Out of all of these people, these are the ones that come to your bridging events. These are the people who respond maybe to um, some literature distribution that you have. You, You write down their names. These are all the people in your church's interest list. Out of these people, this group over here are the ones who actually end up responding to the Bible studies and start in-home Bible studies. Out of the group here that actually respond to the in-home Bible studies, these are the ones that actually show up opening night at your evangelistic meeting. And these are the ones that make a decision for Jesus. You see the way it works? So if you want to increase the numbers down here, what do you have to do up here? 
you've got to make the funnel very big. Does that make sense? The more people you have in your interest list, the more you're connecting with the community, the more people will make decisions and eventually make their decision for Christ and, and join the church. Okay, very quickly, the second reason we forget that the seed is in the harvest, we take a break from evangelism instead of continuing the cycle, letting success grow. You know, I've done some evangelistic meetings where no one's made a decision, but people have come and they've heard truths. And next time we did an evangelistic series, they came again. And this time they were ready to make a decision. So just because you don't see some wonderful results, don't give up and fold your hands and say, well, we tried. You know, it's too bad. This town's non-responsive. No, just keep it going. All right, it'll grow. It'll grow. It'll grow. The more evangelism you do, the quicker it'll grow. Bill McClendon is a layman. He's a pastor now, but he was an elder in the church in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The Bible Belt, strong Baptist community. And um, he had a burden for souls. And he bothered the conference until finally the conference said, all right, is that the time? I've got to finish here. But he bothered the conference so much that finally the conference said, all right, you can go plant a church. And so he did. He went out and planted a church. Bill McClendon has the fastest growing Caucasian church, Adventist church in North America. Here's the statistics. He started with 23 people. And in six years, his membership is over 600. They've moved location three times. They built a new facility. And so I asked Bill, I asked him, I said, Bill, so what's the secret of your success? He smiles and he says, we do eight to ten evangelistic crusades every year. He says, it's just ongoing. One after another, after another, after another. He says, we've got the most beautiful message to share with the world. And he says, if we would but share our message, people will respond. Now, of course, not every church can do eight evangelistic crusades per year. Remember, this was a church plant, so it was a little different. People joined who had a commitment to growth. But we can at least do one per year, right? Or maybe by God's grace, we can do two per year. It doesn't have to be some huge event. Just giving people an opportunity to hear the Advent message and make a decision. We want to keep that evangelism cycle going. Number three, we have weak or disjointed links in this evangelism cycle. Each phase is important. We want to keep it going. Just keep the whole evangelism cycle moving. All right. Well, there's a few more slides that I have, but I see we're out of time. Very quick, we want you to remember that evangelism isn't just an event. It's not even a process, but it's a cycle. The cycle is ongoing. And don't get discouraged if things don't go perfect the first time around. Your success will build as you keep the cycle going. Well, I've gone over time just a little bit, so um, we want to give you a few moments break before we start the 11 o'clock service. Um, let's just bow our heads and have a word of prayer as we finish up the section. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that you have given us a perfect example that we can follow when it comes to evangelism, and that's Christ's method. We see Jesus walking on those dusty roads of Galilee, stopping and visiting with people, healing the sick, uh, helping those who are discouraged, winning people's confidence, and then opening to them the word of life. Father, we want to follow that same example. Give us that same love that Jesus had for those in this community. And Father, give us the wisdom and the courage to do what we can to share you with the world that is in desperate need of hearing the good news. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to study these things together. Thank you for this church. Pray a special blessing upon each person here. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.